My guest today is Joe Petrelli. Joe is the president and co-founder of Demotech, a rating agency based in Columbus, Ohio. Joe is an actuary by training, and prior to founding Demotech in 1985, he's been employed by the Insurance Services Office, Nationwide, and Agway Insurance Company. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. So I'm going to jump right into it, right to what I think is the heart of what really interests me about your business. Rating agencies are underwriting organiz- and underwriting organizations, like insurers, and I think they both have slightly adversarial relationships with their clients. So insurance buyers want cheaper insurance, and rated companies want higher ratings. <laughs> the easiest path to winning more business would clearly be to just give cheaper business and give as you're an insurer and just give higher ratings to everybody if you're a rating agency. Now, both those paths are closed because that would doom the business in the future, I think. So I'm wondering if you agree with that. And two, how would rating agencies distinguish themselves in a competitive environment? Well, maybe I'd take that second one first, if I may, about distinguishing themselves. Uh, D- Demotech, I think, has four characteristics that, that I have not seen with the legacy rating agencies. Uh, thought leadership, insurance expertise, long-tenured credentialed professionals, and, and transparency. And, and I'll spend a little bit of time on each of those, if sure. I may. Uh, on, on the thought leadership, um, we were actually the first company to review and rate independent regional insurance companies. The legacy rating agencies back in the late 80s, the legacy rating agencies would rate a small independent company if it was part of a large group but there was no one reviewing and rating independent regional and specialty companies. And we heard that from uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac about smaller companies. They, they had been doing those sorts of analyses on their own to qualify a company for uh, offering homeowners insurance coverage in the, in, the, in the secondary mortgage marketplace, selling off the uh, the mortgage of the home that was insured. And, and so that's where we got involved. And so, so, so the, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, but yep. the, the insurance company would then own the mortgage? No, the, the, the insurance company that was the homeowner's insurance company would, would insure a home. Oh, and to get credit and, from and Fannie and, and, and to get credit for Fannie and Freddie Got so it. they could sell it to their uh, sellers or services, would sell it and collateralize it. You had to be rated by a certain level company. And, I see. And, and they, they would do the independent regional companies themselves. Right, okay. And they didn't want to do that anymore. Of course. And at that point in time, they contacted the legacy rating agencies um, who would not rate the independent uh, regional and specialty companies. So uh, we got. So these companies had no rating, like a small mutual company in the. the, Because you know what's amazing? Because I think of that these days as being kind of the bread and butter for, let's say, an AM Best. You know, a regional mutual insurance company, that's all they've got. And they've been around for a long time, but they're very small. I mean, were those guys also excluded from this, or is this mostly newer organizations? No, it was it was uh, independent, smaller independent companies. Wow. It, all of them uh, were, were, were not rated. And um, actually, at that point in time, I, I in July of 1990, I actually, after we'd been approved by Fannie and Freddie in 89 and, and 90, I actually had a conversation with uh, Arthur J. Schneider II. Okay. President, chairman, CEO, largest shareholder of of AM Best. Because little do we know, AM Best is a family business. It is. It, yeah. it is a uh, privately held company, um, as are we. Uh, but anyway, the uh, the conversation I had with uh, Arthur J. Schneider II was uh, they never wanted to rate the smaller companies. Huh. Um, and and um, that was his... Because uh, you would think that's where the rating agency would offer the most value, right? Because the smaller companies are the ones perhaps are less certain. The big, huge companies, it's... I don't well, know. Well, which, maybe which, we'll get to that. <laughs> well, I, I think actually I'll transition to it right now because okay. I think that's maybe I think the second the second of the uh, competitive advantages to Demotech is we're insurance people mm. first mm. that got into the insurance ratings business. So we understand the statutory accounting. We understand the conversion to gap. We understand the importance of pricing and loss reserving. And, and then I think you know, hand in hand with that, our, our third competitive advantage uh, facet is that we have credentialed professionals and they've been with Demotech a long time. You don't have to babysit your Demotech analysts. Uh, the, the senior team at at Demotech, myself, uh, Sharon Romano Petrelli, Bob Warren, Barry Kessler, our chief ratings officer, between the four of us, we have 140 years of experience with insurance companies and we have 
16 college degrees and professional credentials. So you don't have to babysit us. We understand the, the industry. And we've worked with companies in every state, every line of business on the PNC and the title underwriter side. And, and so we're very comfortable looking at smaller companies because we understand reinsurance and we also understand that you can be a, a, a bantamweight champion and you're not necessarily going to be put in the same ring with the heavyweight champion. Mm. So we like the idea of, of expertise at different levels. And I think maybe the last thing that I see as a competitive, the fourth thing I see as a competitive advantage for us is what I would call transparency in the sense that, number one, it's transparency of, of the people you're dealing with. Um, myself or Barry, our chief ratings officer, Bob Warren, Sharon, whoever it might be, um, you, you're dealing with an experienced person who understands the insurance business and the other aspect that I think is important on transparency is that we will always be able to point to a company's historical financial statements, whether they're annual statements, quarterly statements, independent audit, loss reserve opinion, pricing analysis, whatever it is. We're going to point to something in their own information that determines why or why not they did not receive a rating. We're not going to hide behind uh, a black box will be able to point to their financial statement that they prepared and say, here's the relationship that's gone sour or south. Um, it might be you've gone from being properly reserved to being inadequately reserved, and that's shown on the one- and two-year development that you've produced in your five-year historical summary in your annual statement or in Part X of your quarterly statement. So it's always about the company's produced its financial statements and we're analyzing them and we're always able to point to that and I think that's very helpful to the companies that we're not making something up we're not projecting something necessarily but we, we are reviewing and analyzing their own data we actually read footnotes and interrogatories and go through the, the financial statement and many times we'll have a company ask us well, where did you get that information and we'll say, well, that's you. Inter inter exactly right. <laughs> yes, exactly, David. We say you. And we, you know, it's interrogatory seventeen. You know, paragraph B, and, and we'll just tell them where we found it. And mm. so, how about how about with a startup? So, one thing that I noticed from your corporate history, and I want to, well, maybe we're going to go backwards a little bit through the timeline. That's totally fine. I'd like jumping around a little bit in this show, that you got a call from the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation, I think it was, or you were contacted by them. After this would be after Andrew or a few years after Andrew, because it's called legacy rating agencies wouldn't rate startups, and this would be a situation where you don't have any financial information to go on, and you can see why somebody would be hampered by that uh, lack of information. Could you tell a story about that? That must have been a big moment for Demotech. Sure, sure. Let, let, me, let me just give you a few dates. We were approved for hazard insurance companies to be acceptable to Fannie Mae. In May of 89, we were approved by uh, Freddie Mac in, I think, January of 1990. So a demo tech rating at a certain level would qualify the homeowner's insurance company to insure the real property that was uh, the collateral to a mortgage. Yep. So that facilitates... Big a, source of business for homeowner's insurers. I it mean, is. Yeah. It is. Big source of business for homeowner's insurers and... Um, is something that you know up until that point in time uh no one no one had been approved by Fannie or Freddie really i think they would make the case that they that i think the terminology they used was they accepted am best they approved us cuz we went through a process ah uh. and we were actually just in terms of history we were actually approved before standard poors moody's and fitch what was that process like was oh. it a process invented and you were the first one through? You guys yeah. the guinea pigs? Yes, very right. much so. I, okay. I, I, Why'd they have a process? What, what, where did that all come from? Do you know? Well, I, all right. I, I do know. Uh, the, um, what we were told, and, and the two folks that coordinated it, Anita Champ at Fannie Mae and Al Laquan at Freddie Mac. I'll never forget those names. Um, they had contacted, um, I think just the AM Best company about doing the ratings of independent regional companies. AM Best had indicated they didn't want they didn't want to do it. Uh, they had indicated it was impossible, or for whatever reason they wouldn't do it. 
And we got drift to that. So we developed a process internally that we thought would be effective in discerning between financially stable and financially uh, troubled insurance companies, heavily dependent on a review of their reinsurance because they're smaller independent companies. Of course. And so we submitted that to Fannie and Freddie, and they don't talk to each other. So we had an internal due diligence at Fannie Mae, and then they sent our process out to a uh, – uh, independent insurance consultant, and then we had an internal due diligence at Freddie Mac, and then they sent our process out to their internal or external um, uh, consultant. So we had four due diligences, internal and external at Fannie, internal and external at, at, at Freddie, and, and we were finally, we were approved hmm. um, and, and uh, by Fannie and Freddie, they, and then they uh, indicated that. And then that was um, close to 30 years ago now. Hmm. And but but the process was very reinsurance intensive because you had to measure not just it was most of the capital in those companies. That's right. I yeah. mean, yeah, rented exactly. I mean, you you and what we we developed the terminology early on. We call it quality and quantity of of reinsurance. The quality being the companies you purchase it from, and the quantity being did you buy the right type, and if you did, did you buy enough of it. But yeah, very much so. Uh, companies that would, and, and and the other thing that we we noticed over time, early on with smaller companies, is they they tend to buy. I don't want to say more than enough, but they tend to buy enough so they could sleep well. Yeah. Most smaller companies. They're risk averse. They very much are. They're, yeah. they're Exactly. They play a, what we call a back game. I mean, they they protect their surplus first, and they'll make money later. Mm. And and. Um, yeah, they are very much risk adverse, and what we've done over time is we've we've actually we look at the transactions, we look at the process, and, and we look at the business model of the insurance company, and and it, the, the reinsurer becomes a partner. And I'll put that in air quotes, but these smaller companies cannot exist without the relationship with their broker, whether it's Beach or whoever it might be, and or with their reinsurers, and they need to do that. They know that. And you, you'll find that many of these small companies have been around forever. Mm. We, we have clients that we rate today that th- their date of incorporation is prior to the Civil War. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, That's I mean, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've got 1837, I think, might be our, our, our oldest client. But um, An interesting contrast to, you know, you guys at that time were a fairly new company. We're, so this might have been the dawn of your your organization's function as a rating agency when you got that approval from Fannie and Freddie, or were you, what were we doing before that? Well, prior to that, we were doing probably some straight-up actuarial work, okay. um, you know, pricing, loss reserving. But I, I think we've also, we also looked at um, public entity liability insurance pools over time. We've done financial due diligence on them. We were actually issued some public entity li- self-funded liability insurance pool ratings uh, that's no. interesting. So, so rating moving agency. over to you never intended to be a rating agency. This was you putting your shingle out, doing actuarial consulting work. Is right. that how Gen- Demo Tech started? Yeah, we actually we we drew, we got drawn into it um, in, in by the opportunity. By the opportunity. Yeah, yeah there was like a, any good businessman. Of course, yeah, there was a gap in the market, and and the legacy rating agencies. I mean, the truth of the matter is, that, um, for them, um, you know, they were they were dealing with the larger publicly traded worldwide yep. carriers and a lot um, of money. Lot, <laughs> Big fees, yeah. Well, I, I you know, I wish, uh, I don't know, but I assume that's <laughs> the case. But I, I think, you know, what we looked at is we look at both the PNC as well as the life and health industry. If you look at it as a, a, a from a, from a size perspective, there's about 2,600 companies that report data on the property casualty side to the NAIC, and there's about 1,600 on the life and health side. And, and the numbers, the percentages are almost identical. On on the PNC side of the 2,600, 400 companies, which is about 15% of the companies by count, write 85% of the premium. Yeah. Right? And, and so you've got 85% of the companies by count competing for 15% of the premium. Yeah. And, and so we went after the 85% by count competing yeah. for 15% of the, the underserved premium. underserved market. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and so and and the legacy rating agents, I I think were you know focused on on the upper end of the market, which is amazing. And and that's that would have been your 
your bread and butter, your own bread and butter as an actuarial consulting firm, because those are the ones who need the statement of actuarial opinion, who need all that consulting work that you were selling. So they were already your customer base, a lot of these folks, I would think. Is that right? Well, they could have been, but we, we right now, we, we, sort, we segregate. We don't, um, we've got over 400 companies that we work with on uh, a ratings perspective, and we have about 60 that we do consulting for. So you could look at maybe 460, 470 clients, and I can say, you know, less than 1% of them, um, maybe not even 1% of them, but that would be five. We basically do one service or the other. Mm. And, and so, Do you ever do both? Um, if we do both, it's very rare. Um, and, and like I say, if we do, there might be two or three out of almost 500. And we disclose that both on our website uh, and on in our report. Sure, because that could be a potential conflict, couldn't it? It could right? be. Right, so you're saying you want a better rating. Why don't you buy this all this really high-priced consulting mm -hmm. services from me? You know, I'm not obviously not saying you do that, but there's perception, right, can be powerful. There is perception. I think our, our actually, it, it kind of works the other way around, is we, we, we actually uh, have a, 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 a determination letter from the actuarial board for conduct and discipline that basically indicates that we should disclose on our site and in our reports. And what we've done instead is we've actually gotten to the point where there's next to no one that we do both for. Yeah, it's just yeah, easy. that's cleaner. It's easier. It, yeah. it really is. And and the truth of the matter is, if a company has a bad balance sheet, there's not much you could do for them, no matter what it is. Whether mm. it's a statement of actual opinion, whether it's a pricing recommendation, whether it's a rating per se. I mean. So, so part of our business model has been to only finalize ratings on companies that we can help. Mm. So if a company has a poor financial rating from us, we will submit what we call a preliminary financial stability rating, and it will be a low preliminary financial stability rating. But the only companies that we really would envision finalizing a preliminary rating would be the ones that we could actually help them mm. because we've identified them as strong. Mm. So you don't need a rating if the rating's not good. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, yeah. we think there's enough folks out there that kind of chasing the uh, chasing the companies or pushing them to the bottom. It's not our business model. Plus, the other thing you, you, you will you see, and I'm sure it's the same way in, in all industries, is if you don't have a client that's financially sound and knows what they're doing and is a good company to begin with, it's a time burner. There's not enough money in the world to work with a poor company. It, yeah. it just burns so much of your time and effort, and they have so many problems. So our, our business model is find good companies that are either unrated or underrated by the by the uh, legacy rating agencies, and then work with them to... Um, to, to, to help them grow. And one other area I noticed that you moved into a gap was title insurance. And that happened in the early 90s as well. I don't know if that was one of the dates you mentioned there, but maybe talk a little bit about what the opportunity was there and what you did about it. Title underwriters. Um, at, at the time that we got involved, and, and just to give you a little history, 1986, I did my MBA research project on title insurance. And it was called. Why? Why? <laughs> I, Not the first one to come to my mind. <laughs> no, well, I, I I've always been fascinated by title insurance. It is it is a weird weird business, isn't it? Very much so. But you know the thing about it that it, it's it's a one time premium. It's a policy that is effectively a retrospective policy mm. because it says on this day that you're buying your house, we've looked backwards, or it's actually the real property. It's not even about the house. We've looked backwards. And as of today, your title to this property is as presented. So it's clean. Uh, they would call a, a, a marketable title. And so I was always fascinated by it. And I um, was fortunate to have a, a client at the time that was a title underwriter, as well as a P&C company they had in their, in their family. And, okay. and, and so I got interested in it. And uh, pe people always are obsessed with the low loss ratios. Um, but it's a very, it's an industry that's actually shooting for a zero loss ratio. Yeah. Cause you wrote a paper on that as well, right? Yeah. Saying the communication problem yeah. of, of, of talking about title insurance results, maybe summarize the conclusion, maybe you touched on it there, but. Well, but I think, you know, the, basically what you have with, a, with a title underwriter is that they will, they will spend all their money fixing the problems and identifying the problems 
on a retrospective basis so that you will have, on the day you purchase your home, a, um, a marketable title. And so that they'll go in and, you know, people think it's, um, you know, just a matter of figuring out, well, we'll prorate the property taxes between the buyer and the seller. We'll pay off the old mortgage. There's a lot of other things that are just fascinating things. You'll find errors, H-E-I-R-S, that may or may not be listed. Um, you know, and, and, and again, if you look back in, in, you know, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, I mean, people would, you know, maybe have a child out of wedlock and, you got an heir to the property that doesn't exist, and nobody's taking, you know, and nobody's taking credit for, and, uh, and 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 things like that happen. You'll find uh, there was a picture one time uh, of, of a property that had railroad tracks on all four sides of it, and uh, it, it was it was basically inaccessible, uh, and somebody bought it sight unseen, and uh, the the, uh, the uh, title underwriter, you know, it disclosed all that in in the uh, in the deed that you know you've got to have four rights of way to get to your own property. Uh, just strange things like that. Yeah, it, it, it's really an interesting business. And, and and so, why do they need you? Why do they need a financial strength rating if there's no loss ratio? What? How, how do? You, where do you fit in there? Not well. In we we started rating the industry in 1992. In 1994, the secondary mortgage marketplace to protect the purchasers of collateralized mortgage obligations at, at Fannie and Freddie and okay. Secondary Mortgage Marketplace said, you have to have a title underwriter that's financially stable so they'll be around to pay the claim. And, right. and so it became a requirement in the Secondary Mortgage and Marketplace. it wasn't before that. No, it so wasn't. So there was a big moment for the title industry. It was. And wow. They did and another big moment about 15 years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not as nice. No, right, right. When, 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 when the bottom fell out. I, I tell you one quick story about title industry. Yes, it was a big moment for them, but they did not like the idea of, of people uh, looking at the title industry who were from outside the title industry. Okay, yep. I, I actually registered for um, attending one of their annual meetings and, and uh, back in the early 90s to kind of introduce myself and walk around and just say hi. And, and they actually refunded my money. They actually contacted me and said, we don't want you here. What? Then, and I said, well, that's fine. So, uh, you know, it was, it was actually it was quite ironic. But uh, yeah. it's now it's become an accepted part of it, and there's a, a fair number of companies. They let you in the meetings now. That's right. I get to go. <laughs> um, but, but the industry's consolidated. When, when you look at the um, in, cost of an independent audit, cost of a statement of actuarial opinion, and there's multiple companies that were within one family, and a lot of those have consolidated. The industry's gone from about 110 companies in a very orderly fashion, uh, down to less than 45. Wow. So, but it, it's, um, it, it's, again, it's just a fascinating industry. And we were, we, again, it was part of our thought leadership. We were there first and, um, no, hey, you found open a market. And, yeah, we did. Yeah. And, and, and the nice part about it is we also, again, keeping consistent with our, our, our own business model, we are the only ones that rate the entire industry from the biggest down to the smallest. We've done that since 1992. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the big companies being rated by Demotech, it's the regionals as well. And we have a very uh, elaborate and ongoing quarterly review process that has been very successful in, in terms of discerning between uh, solvent and solvent. So let's pick the story back up to Florida. Okay. So what you did? You get a call? Did you get a letter? You, you probably realized there was an issue there because um, you saw the hurricane smash into Miami. Yeah. Uh, okay, what, what was going through your mind? You know, had you been lobbying them? What happened? Not at all. I, I, I uh, Andrew hits Florida uh, what, August in 1992. Property market, residential property insurance market in Florida is devastated. Uh, if you go back to the good old days, that was the Department of Insurance in Florida, and and the I think also the the fire marshal was Thomas, Tom Gallagher was the commissioner of insurance, and um, I've spoken to him over the past twenty some years. We've been operative in Florida, and he will say he had to liquidate twenty two or more companies from wow. Andrew. Yeah. Wow. So, a a Andrew, that's I a mean, hard market for you, kids. Oh, it was. It, he he'll he'll tell you. He says uh, property underwriter, property companies went under, automobile companies went under. He says, 
we had over 20 insolvencies in the next couple of years. You know what's amazing about that? If I don't mind my interrupting, just something occurred to me. You, you take it, you know, historical cat losses, let's say Andrew, and you say inflation adjusted, uh, you know, Irma or whatever, or Maria is bigger than Andrew's. Like, that's, that's the wrong way of looking at it, right? Market impact adjusted, those are just non, non factors. You know, you have liquidating 20 something companies. I don't care how big the storm was, that was a big event. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and and I think if you, if somebody were actually able to look back at, and have in 1992 have you know here we would we'd have to be 20, uh, 26 years later we'd have to look at that. But the truth of the matter is, that was because companies were just under reinsured, right? I mean, it, it really was because yeah. I'm told those were the early days when. Um, you know, they didn't have cap models. I mean, I mean cap, forgetting cap models, they, they, they couldn't pull their stuff on a map and see, right. oh, it's all in the same, you know, with two counties that are next to each other. They're simpler things right. even than cap modeling. But, I mean, this is when, you know, the, 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 the sophistication that we have today versus then on the reinsurance side, it just didn't exist. And companies just under-reinsured. Mm. So they, they set up what was called the, the Florida Residential Property Casualty JUA. And... It became the largest residential property insurer in the state. And sometime in 1995-96, the state of Florida legislature introduced uh, a bill to depopulate the JUA, the Joint Underwriting Authority, and they, the... Because they'd picked up all this business. Because they'd picked up all this business. Loads they, of it. they didn't want it. They wanted to get it back to I mean, private wait, what sector. What if it happens again? Somebody yeah, right. might have asked. <laughs> Big problem. We, 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 I'll be glad to touch on that one when, when, sure. when, when we get through this. But the, the, they called, the, they basically, the, the Florida Bankers Association amended the legislation to depopulate the JUA. They were going to set up uh, startup companies. They were going to incentivize them to, to capitalize companies and take business out of the, out of the JUA. And the Florida Bankers Association attached an amendment that said, but the new companies have to be acceptable to the secondary mortgage marketplace so we can sell their mortgages off. Ah, okay, right. I mean, wait a minute. I know what to do about that. And, joke. well, I, 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 I will be honest. I, we were approved in 89 and 90, so, that, you know, this is six years later. Um, we got a call from uh, a woman's name was uh, Madeline McGuckin in government and industry relations and she called us on behalf of commissioner gallagher and uh i i'm smart enough to know that we were not the first call so i would respectfully suggest that the legacy rating agencies declined the opportunity wow why and uh al laquan who was the gentleman who had done our review at at uh, freddie mac i remember al laquan calling me and saying you're going to get a call from madeline mcguckin at the Florida Department of Insurance, and I want you to take that call, and I want you to talk with her, because I think you might be able to help us out. And she called me and said, Aliquan at Freddie Mac said, we got to get these companies accepted by the secondary mortgage marketplace, and he said, if I called Joe Petrelli at Demotech, he'd figure out a way to help us do it right. And and I think that when, again, going back to our, our initial involvement with Fannie and Freddie with independent regional specialty companies it was all about the reinsurance and in the cat prone area like florida it's all about the reinsurance yep and and so we leveraged again leveraged our own knowledge of uh, industry knowledge and our own familiarity with reinsurance and and uh we we assisted in in the takeout companies that had uh and and we've been there since we i think the demo tech rated companies in florida probably have Anywhere from sixty to seventy percent of the residential property market, and and, and those are, it, it, which is a higher percentage than we have countrywide with our other three hundred fifty plus companies that are not in Florida. So so let's be charitable to your competitors for a sec, okay? Reinsurance is pretty normal thing, and you mentioned it a few times as really an important piece of your capability and what distinguishes you is knowledge and ability to evaluate reinsurance as part of the capital structure of a company did, did the other just not get it did they what where was it just an oversight i mean because you can understand reinsurance right i mean it's not that i mean it's complicated enough but 
somebody can develop the capability if it's that important. What what what, what did they miss? Well, I I, I mean I, I I don't know. Uh, I, I can't speak with any certainty to that, but I I, w- I would speculate that. If you're in the insurance industry and you've been brought up in the insurance industry, the analysis of reinsurance is, is an extension of your general knowledge base. Whereas right. you could be an analyst of, you could be a very good analyst of airlines, bonds, and stocks. You could be a very good analyst of distillery bonds and stocks, and you're never going to see anything like reinsurance. So yep. I think the difference between financial analysis and insurance financial analysis is credential insurance professionals which Devotech has on staff yep. i mean i i so i don't know but why they invested presumably well it, funny thing because they're an insurance focused i i i, I can't speak to what am best did yeah. but but i mean i i just go back to 1990 and my my conversation with arthur j schneider the second where he said we we didn't want to rate small companies yeah and so what you had in florida by definition was small companies and and so I don't know if that's why they did it, and I I, I can't speculate on that. Mm. But but I know that well, if you're not rating small companies, so would go the logic, then you have less experience working with reinsurance, and so maybe it's something you're just not. I mean, if that was a philosophical position of theirs, and since they've no doubt reversed that, I mean, they do rate all kinds of companies now, as far as I know. You can correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. They will have built up that capability, yeah, maybe in response to your success. Well, I mean, yeah, there, that, that's maybe for another podcast. I could tell you a story there, but I, I won't. Um, I will say this, though. I, I think the other thing you have to be familiar with, with not just startup companies, with smaller companies, you, you, know, there, you have to be familiar with underwriting guidelines. You have to be familiar with claims procedures and mm. processes. You have to have some sense of the formality or informality of their pricing, Um policy provisions, whether or not they're using standard policies or they have got sublimits built into policies, their investment uh, opportunities, the importance of the reinsurance to the, to the overall equation, I think is exaggerated with the smaller companies yeah. because it is a critical component of their financial stability. And, and from our perspective, I mean, if, if you look at a small company and, and they're all – from our perspective, it, it's sort of a matter of if you took, um, I'll, I'll, I'll use State Farm as a reference because they're the biggest company, but if you knock six zeros off of State Farm's balance sheet and income statement and you had the same proportionality in the balance sheet and the income statement, you'd still have a fine company. It just wouldn't be as big, but the proportionality would be there. And, and so the reinsurance gives that smaller company that's still financially sound with integrity in its balance sheet it gives them the ability to not have to get those extra six zeros in the balance sheet and income statement to to be able to compete in the marketplace Mm -hmm. um so but it tends to be the case though that it's it's not it's not obvious i suppose that just because somebody is small and buys lots of reinsurance i mean it feels like there's there's still maybe this is your whole point is that there are certain kinds of risks associated with that. I mean, the one that comes to mind is reinstatement premiums, right? So let's say you're, you're a catastrophe-prone writer and you buy a bunch of cat excess of loss. Uh, you know, we're throwing a lot of jargon here. This would be, you know, a, a, the capital you're required to write in Florida, let's say, or Texas or the Northeast. And then you don't realize that you, you know, have this sort of contingent. You're not going to get all the limit because you have to prepay the, the reinstated cover after the event happens. And then you, you lose a ton of surplus and you have to recapitalize. Um, you know, that, that's an example of, of perhaps a, a blind spot. Sorry, you go ahead. No, I, I think you're, you're exactly right. I think what, what we've done at DemoTech to mitigate some, some of these situations, we look at the vertical and the horizontal programs of the companies, and we will require, um, you know, certainly uh, reinstatement prote- premium protection. But I think we're looking at it, we will also limit, a company's maximum net retention on a pre-tax basis. So we're, we're going to tell a company you can't do more than, say, 10 or 15% of your surplus as your net retention right. on the first event. And on the second event, if for the same season, it'll be a smaller percentage because theoretically they will now have a smaller surplus. So the cost of reinsurance becomes a critical driver 
uh, because we're going to have not we're going to make the the smaller companies they're going to have to buy an awful lot of it not j- and they're going to have to buy down to a, a relatively low retention and concurrently buy up to a vertical limit that is acceptable to us uh, so and then that's just the first event there's going to be multiple events after that and we're we're always looking at you know what might be the annual aggregate we're, we're we're much more concerned i think with a small company we're much more concerned with a series of storms in the same season mm. than we are uh we're certainly interested in, in the vertical limit but a series of storms in the same season season is appreciably more could be appreciably more devastating and, and, and just for example, in the 2017 season, uh, Demotech had four property writers that wrote in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and um, obviously, you know, they were devastated by the, the storms in, in the fall of 2017. Every one of the companies we worked with in Puerto Rico, matter of fact, every one of the companies we work with countrywide uh, survived 2017, even even the one the four in Puerto Rico. That wrote in Puerto Rico. So I mean, buying enough reinsurance is with the modeling that's out there, and and I think the tools that the reinsurance uh, brokers bring to the table, and I think the, the the sophistication that's developed to a large extent within the state of Florida. Um, I, I I think we're we're approaching the point where some companies can look at the purchase of reinsurance. It, it's approaching a science. It's mm-hmm. no longer an art. Well, what do you think about, just because we're, we're in the weeds a little bit, uh, if you don't mind just carrying on for a second, another thing that came across recently, not in, not, not in relation actually uh, to, to a company that's rated by your organization, but generally the idea of a parental help or a guarantee. And we had, I had a, a reinsurance client that um, has a fairly thinly capitalized company, but they have other organizations within called the ecosystem, which are all have the same ownership. And they say, we'll recapitalize this insurance company if something goes wrong. What do you think about those situations? You must have come across that pretty frequently. Um, we, we've we seen that. Um, we've had, at different points in the past, we've had uh, assurances about certain things uh, of that nature. Uh, and we've actually had kind of a mixed response. Mm. Uh, we've had some very well-known international names that have made assurances of that type and then at the last minute um, they've, they've not come through so what we've done is we've we're educable we've evolved over time and I think in, in the current situation and, and that would be maybe the last five six years to date uh, we're much less tolerant of that is that right and we're, we're more inclined to see the money come in as a matter of fact one of the things that we prepared, um, and, and we've yet to release, but we're, we're close. We've actually prepared a PowerPoint that describes to the investment community yeah. some of the key differences between statutory accounting and gap accounting. Okay, yeah, yeah, because the gap guys can wander in here <laughs> it, and then it, start it, paying it. policy fees up front. And, yep. <laughs> or what, or, yeah. Yep, it's and you, you're, you're right. And, and what we've seen is that investment people, I mean, to look at the rate of return, whether it's on assets or net worth, uh, the more thinly capitalized the company, the better the rates of return. Sure. And I think from our perspective... Shrink that denominator, the ratio goes up. (laughs) That's right. Well, you know. Yeah. And our philosophy is, you know what, why don't you put the money in now and... uh, (laughs) And we'd rather see it now. So we're we're much less tolerant in in 2018 than we have been in the past. Interesting. That that actually touches on another area that I was really interested to get into with you, which is the idea of who are the stakeholders that you serve. And so, what's interesting to me about rating agencies is, on the one hand, you'll have the company which pays the fee, right? So you rate it, rate, you get rating from us, you're going to pay a fee for that. But the company doesn't themselves actually need it. Right, they're taking it and they're giving it to others. Right, so you'll have certain, perhaps they're going to be a vendor or a supplier for somebody. For example, if Annie and Freddie come to mind, you'll have investors, maybe you'll have agencies, agents that's the producing the business for this company that want it. Who who would you say are the most important stakeholders in what that you're really serving, if you know what I mean, and kind of like a social sense? Yeah, no, that's a great question, David. I I think from my perspective, we. We focus on the insurance 
company functionality first. We think you're an insurance company first. And and so therefore your your primary stakeholders or maybe your initial stakeholders would be your producers, your claimants, your employees, your reinsurers, state of domicile, the regulators. I, I think investors from our perspective, if someone's investing in an insurance company, we think they should understand what an insurance company is. And and there will be claims from time to time. And the reason people's life has less risk is because the insurance company has taken on that part of it. So w- we think the investment piece is an important piece. H- however, we think the first thing a company has to do is be properly reserved, have high quality assets behind that, backing those claims, have high quality and quantity of reinsurance, and keep their financial leverage at, a, at an acceptable level so that they're positioned to succeed. So we think if you've got a good business model, the right pricing, the right reinsurance, the right people, the right plan, that it, if you know what you're doing, you're eventually going to make money, but we don't expect an insurance company to make money every quarter, every you know year over year, this quarter better than last quarter. No, that's not the nature of the business. And we've actually sent out press releases to that effect in, in prior periods. Uh, several years ago, um, when, when the Midwest had tornado after tornado and hailstorm after hailstorm, the, some of the publicly traded companies, the first press release you saw was they were apologizing to their investors that you know, these storms had impacted their quarterly earnings. And we think insurance companies should be proud of rebuilding homes, rebuilding businesses, and paying claims. And so you see yourself in this case as an interpreter of the insurance, I suppose, the results of the insurance industry on be, for, for these different stakeholders who that might not themselves understand that, you know, say a producing agent or somebody, I mean, uh, you know, what are you, you're supplying a service there. Our, our, our philosophy would be that the producer, the claimant, the insured are pretty much in the same boat. They, they, the producer, the insured, and the claimant all want a good good coverage, very little claims friction in terms of getting um, a meritorious claim presented and paid. And if the insurance company makes money, that's fine. But an insurance company doesn't have to make money on every transaction or even every quarter to be a successful insurance company. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had situations, again, going back to using the Midwest as an example and, and even northern Texas area in Oklahoma, we had companies a few years ago that had unprecedented hail and tornado and wind and they just lost the most they could. They had an aggregate on top of everything, but they lost like close to a third of their surplus. We had their financial plans before and after. We knew they could lose up to a third of their surplus. We, we saw all that. And we also saw that by the end of that calendar year, they would replace through earnings, if nothing else happened, they would replace that surplus mm. because of, of the the, uh, the way their seasonality, of their book of business throughout the year and everything else. We hung in there with those companies, and every one of them, there were no additional storms, every one of them bounced back. So you had a situation where they lost a third of their surplus. Fortunately, they were extremely well capitalized to begin with, but from our perspective... We knew that going in. We knew what their aggregate was. We knew what their their net retention was under the worst case scenario. We knew their management. We knew their pricing philosophy. We knew who their reinsurers were. We knew the type of program they had. And we had essentially said, yeah, if that happens, we're going to hang in there with you. And then it did happen. And we hung in there with them. And it's because they're insurance companies first. And consistent with our own internal philosophy, because they knew what they were doing and they had the right quality and quantity of reinsurance, today their surplus position is stronger than it was three or four or five years ago when that happened because they know what they're doing. And I, I think this idea of earnings and earnings quality, we've actually come up with an index on that that we recently introduced. And the we call it Spequella. 
uh, it's statutory pre-tax earnings quality using emerging loss, loss adjustment expense estimates. And we think the first thing an insurance company should do is put up adequate reserves. We don't want to pressure them into trying to earn a certain return because we, I think we all know if, if an insurance company needs to earn $10,000 more, the way to get it is to reduce your IBNR by $10,000 or to reduce loss reserves by $10,000, and that's not the answer. So have, an, have a balance sheet with integrity, have a business model that works, have a consistent re, a reinsurance program that's consistent with your business model, have high-quality reinsurers doing that, and if you know what you're doing, you will eventually make money. Do you, uh, coming back to this stakeholders idea just for one sec, do you think of them as targets for, I don't know what the right word is, call, call it you know, promotional work, if that's the right word, or, um, or the need to explain to them what you do and why you do it and why you're as good as somebody else or better? You know, do, do you, do you uh, actually focus on them, communicating efforts on them to talk about demo tech and what you're doing? And I'm talking about, let's say, agents or let's say, um, I'm not sure who else I would think about, you know, maybe, maybe TPAs or whoever the people are that would convince them, could then be able to help convince insurers that they should use you as well. Do you, do you, talk, about, do you talk to them, to the other groups directly? We, we, we speak a fair amount. Um, we speak to st- different state associations we're right. active in, and, and we, regulators, we try to get out, talk to regulators. Um, we've started publishing the demo tech difference uh, to get get our philosophy and who we are out to as many people as we can. Uh, our quarterly magazine. Uh, one of the things that we've done from day one, day one, we publish on our website. It's been there since 1989. For each of our rating categories, our top category is A double prime. Our second category is A prime. A, S is in substantial, M is in moderate, and L is in license. We have a fairly limited number. We have six primary ratings. And we assign to each of those ratings a probability of survival 18 months after we withdraw the rating. Okay. So, so for A double prime... Uh, it's we we said that a double prime a hundred percent of the companies we rate a double prime will survive at least eighteen months after we withdraw that rating. At least ninety nine percent of the A primes, at least ninety seven percent of the A's, at least ninety five percent of the S's, and at least ninety percent of the M's. After if we withdraw the rating and it, and it goes from Rated to unrated, you got at least 18 months, and those are the survival percents. In terms of what we do to show people that we have confidence in our ratings, we have self-published our record from 1989 to date, annually updating it. And this last year, year year-end 2016, we're in the process of getting a 2017 update. We retained two distinguished professors, both of whom had worked with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Um, Robert Klein was their economist for years, and he had been at the Michigan Insurance Bureau. He's at Georgia State University, Dr. Robert Klein. And Dr. Michael Barth is, I think, assistant dean at the uh, at the Citadel. He's another PhD. He's also a CPCU. Um, he was at the NEIC and developed, uh, was actively involved in the development of, of risk-based capital for NEIC. So we got two distinguished insurance professors. We gave them every one of our ratings from 1989 to date and said, here's who we think went under, here's when we think they went under, and there was over, over 42, 40, 42,000 iterations. And we said, check them, check our math. And they did it. And they published the report in, in February of 2018. And they basically said, we hit our marks every year from 1989 to date. Cool. And oh, well, we should have put a link up to that in and, the podcast notes. Well, I, we are certainly welcome to do that. I mean, and, and these are two distinguished gentlemen whose, whose, whose vitas are, are thicker and longer than, than the report. But, but the point is, they, they know what they're doing, and they... they we we actually had a little bit of a, a 
uh, a discussion about the methodology for doing it. And when they did our, our the analysis of ours, they did it based on survi- failure rates, and then one minus the failure rate gives you the survival rate. Um, they actually used what they thought was a, a more conservative calculation than some that are in use by other you know legacy rating agencies and I said do what you think's the right thing and we still hit all our marks for you know 29 years in a row on every one of those ratings so I think if if you're an agent or or you're um, uh, or even a reinsurance broker I, I think that they should not assume that the rating of the legacy rating agencies is is what they think it is because um, they've they've I think that there's been a, you know, people uh, have created a, a, a myth about what ratings actually do. But this this report that was done by Drs. Barth and Klein, they actually thought it was uh, so unique and unprecedented, they actually m- sent a copy of it to every department of insurance, mm. saying this has never been done before in academia, that no was ever, no rating agencies ever said, you know, Here, here's what we did. Here's here's what the rating was. Here's when we revised it. Here's when the company went under. Uh, it was the first time ever, and um, we were pleased. I mean that, that we now have uh, t- two distinguished gentlemen who 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 verified this on our behalf. What uh, one of the things I want to get at, and I guess that that was a version of this topic, but let's hit it again. Is what what holds you back from growing, from doing yet more companies, and maybe if you can, as a lead into that. Uh, say what the footer of your email says on no competition, no monopoly. Well, I, I yeah, I mean, our, our, my, my, my email, it's a K N O W competition, N O monopoly, N O competition, K N O W monopoly. I, I think there is a, a, a functional monopoly, um, in, in the insurance ratings business. Um, I think it's been there for, for a long period of time. And um, you know we we fight that on a daily basis um, because it's embedded everywhere, and and I use the term functional monopoly. Um, it's actually a, I, I took that from a note that um, I forget the gentleman's name, but he was a, a vice president in AM Best when he was corresponding with the Securities and Exchange Commission. He used the term functional monopoly to describe a situation where. 97% of the business was written by three companies. And and so I, I think to the extent that one entity reviews and rates 98% of the premium volume in the world, that I can use their own term, functional monopoly. Hmm. Um, but I, I don't know that anything actually holds us back. I think there's a, a fair number of companies out there that are 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 have learned maybe to live without a rating because they don't want to go through the time and expense of the process with with the legacy rating agencies. I think if we're U.S.-based only, um, Hawaii, Alaska, Commonwealth, Puerto Rico, the the 48 mainland states, um, and we've had, um, we're up over 400 companies. And I think it's ironic that when you look at when one looks at some of the other legacy rating agencies in the United States, that our count is um, is about as strong as theirs is, as high as theirs is. The the difference between our count and their count is is that if you net out companies that are dual rated by another legacy rating agency. Um, we actually have the highest count of uniquely rated companies. We're, we're second to um, to AM Best in the United States in terms of uniquely rated companies by count. Um, the good folks at Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, um, they rate perhaps as many companies, maybe even more, but they're effectively dual-rated companies. We're, at, we're adding a, a large number of small companies. Um, but I think we're... We're open for growth, if that's the question. I think from our perspective, um, there is a need um, and a competition, uh, for a need for competition, particularly among the smaller companies, because I, I think there is a very distinct bias against 
independent regional and specialty companies, particularly if they're small and they're mutual. Uh, I, I think that the ratings will show that that mm. that um, that there's a, a whether it's whether it's based on the fact that you know you should be diversified geographically or or product line or whether it's based on something more formulaic. Uh, I don't know, but again, from a from a practical perspective, if you look at the, the, the composition of the insurance industry on the PNC side, 2,600 companies report data to the NAIC. Approximately 1,400 of them, about 51, 52%, write in one state or one line. So you've got 1,400 out of 2,600 that are in one state or one line and, and so we can talk about diversification, but again, by percentages, we are not a diversified industry. Mm. We're an industry that focuses on niches, mm-hmm. and that niche can be a state or that niche can be a line of business. Mm-hmm. And again, we we respect the fact that companies can be specialists in in a state or or in a line of business, and we don't think that the diversification element is as important as other people think it might be other other legacy rating agencies think it might be and and we think again going back to the the reason they can come smaller companies can do that it's because they have protected themselves they're buying the diversification from somebody else through the through the reinsurance yeah. exactly i yeah. mean they're buying the protection yeah and i mean at the same time you know if you look at reinsurance and you, you made the great point earlier it, you're, you're buying capital but concurrently you're limiting your risk on the lack of diversification. Yeah. And and again, if companies know what they're doing, I we don't see the need uh, for an overly aggressive diversification. Okay. Let me let me so let me play devil's advocate. Now, I I don't necessarily believe this, but this is an interesting argument, I think. So actually, the the business monopoly this is a business which is naturally monopolistic. And the, and I'll use a term from Call it the tech strategy world. Network effects is the reason why. And what a network effect is is that the value of an organization increases with the square of the number of people who are in it. So, Facebook classic example, right? Where if you're in a social network, if you just you and I are in a social network, it's worth so much. But if both of our families are and all of our friends are, the value of the network increases massively, much more than just with the number of people in it. And AM Best, you could think of them, or a, a dominant rating agency of any sort are benefiting from the fact that they are the standard. And you can only be the standard if you get over that hump in the network of all the people that agree on that together and they kind of collectively want a monopoly in some sense because it's just too hard to have two standards because it's more valuable to them when there's one. What do you think about that argument? Um, I guess I, I think that uh, I, I don't think much of it personally, but I would say that there's a fair number of people in the insurance industry sure. that are evidently buying into it. Right. Uh, but but I think it, it's fascinating to me because if we took that same discussion and we said there should be but one reinsurance company in the world mm. or there should be one architect who designs insurance company home offices or there should be one rug manufacturer who sells to insurance companies, people would say that's ridiculous. However, if we get into the area of insurance company ratings, all of a sudden what would have been ridiculous for any other discipline seems to be something that's reasonable. Is there nothing different about insurance regulation? Like, is there, is well, it... I mean, I, I think the regulatory part of it, one, one of the fascinating things, I, I think that there has been, and I say I, I think there's been, uh, some rethinking on the part of some regulators, and, and I say that not the regulator in terms of the, the departments of insurance per se, but the, the National Conference of Insurance Legislators has passed a, a model act that does two things. It, number one, it reinforces that the states are in charge of the business of insurance and no one else. And the second thing that they said in their model act was that one of the ways to show that the states are in charge is that there should be more competition amongst insurer rating agencies. Hmm. So it's starting to get the attention. And I, I think I've read some articles um, that, that that have indicated, I think there was an article in um, Missouri Bar 
magazine that was authored by um, uh, Charles Chemnitz, who uh, the, the president of NAMIC. And it was a few years ago, and he, he talked about the fact there's really there's no requirement to be rated, mm. that, that this is a company choice, and some companies like to be rated, some companies don't. And, um, and and that the the rating agency that the company selects should be the one that the company feels is is m- more comfortable with, whether it's their their process or their people or or their procedures. And so, I mean, from my perspective, the idea that one size fits all um, it makes little sense to me. Uh, one size rating agency fits all companies, and I think that when we look at what we did. Uh, in, with title underwriters back in 1992 to be thought leaders, uh, with regional and specialty companies back in 1989, 1990, what we did in, in Florida in 96, we were able to step in and assist not just consumers, but the companies and the brokers and the, the lenders, the bankers. And, and part of it is because we're ready. And I think from my perspective, when you look at an insurance company, at the end of the day, what you want is an insurance company that can pay a claim. And so from our perspective, we're, fo- we're going to continue to focus on survival rates of the companies that we review and rate. They're, they're very favorable. They compare extremely well to legacy rating agencies. Um, and I think, you know, eventually, after having done this for 29 years, I say eventually, um, I think that that's the way you grow the critical mass. And, and I think that it's as much a factor of what we're doing at Demotech, but I think the other thing that's happening, and, and I'm not familiar with the, the idea of the, the network process that you discussed, but from our perspective, the other thing that's happening is that the legacy rating agencies are doing, are making changes and doing things and maybe reexamining themselves too, and I think part of that, part of what the marketplace will see at the end of the day is that it's it's about our effectiveness and it's about what we could do for them. Um, but it's also about the fact that we we at Demotech probably better positioned to understand them immediately because we've got you know, CPAs on staff that have been uh, the CFOs of insurance companies. We've got people on staff that have been on the boards of insurance companies and are no longer there. We've got people on staff that have been on the board of governors of the Chartered Property Casualty Underwriters Association for eight years. Um, and we've got people that, that have been doing financial analysis and insurance financial analysis for 30, 40 years. So I, I think at some point, um, while I understand the idea about uh, you know the bigger bigger is better, we continue to grow. In terms of count, um, we're at we're at over 400 now. Last year at this time, we were probably 350. Mm. So we're picking up almost a company a week, um, and, and 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 part of that's happening, you know, over an extended period of time when the title industry, which we've been an integral part of, has shrunk from over 100 to less than 50. We still continue to add to count. So. Um, I hear you. I, I appreciate it. And a- anybody that's listening that would want to uh, to expo- explore uh, helping us grow that number so we can increase that square, I'm in. You know, the, what, I, what I love about and I meant, uh, meant to actually mention this earlier, and I, I forgot about it, but it's back. And this comment is, what you are actually, it's interesting, is what are would be the technical classic definition of a disruptive innovator. Because this guy, Clay Christensen, who is this Harvard professor who wrote a book and an article called The um, the Innovator's Dilemma. And his point there is there's such a thing as a disruptive innovator. You see the word disruption all over the place these days, right? But he meant it in a very specific way. And one of the ways in which he meant it was to say that when you have a, a company that we have an overlooked customer base and a new entrant can come in and serve that overlooked customer base and then move up market, that's the progress that a disruptive innovator takes. And there's all kinds of interesting examples steel mills, network drives, all kinds of neat things. And that, and that is what you're doing. Well, I'll put up a link to, to that as well. Um, and uh, that's something that a lot of people say they want to do and very, very hard to pull off. So, you know, congratulations on that. What, what I, want to, I want to maybe close, because we're running out of time here, on this idea of the process that you go through and, and that is the standards you apply to, to, to 
anoint something acceptable or not, right? So you have these conventions, I think, of in the business. You know, take, for example, the one in a hundred cat event, right? Which is a made up number for every company because one, it's, it's, it's a made up number because it's never happened to the portfolio itself, but it's also made up in the sense of the scenario that they're modeling is, is, is invented as well within the cat model. And then there are certain standards for, let's call it one or two year reserve releases. And you mentioned that before. And there's, in every, in every potential risk category of an insurance, you'll have these rules of thumb or quantitative rules that you apply. And sometimes you might change what that rule is, right? So the model might change or whatever changes. And I'm wondering how you, how you know when the time is right to do that. Because if you, think about if you, if you overdid it, think about that scenario, right? where you violated the expectations too strongly of your constituents, right? And you said, actually, we're going to require you to go to the one in a thousand now on your catastrophe events. And then everybody, you know, too bad if you're, if you don't meet that, then you don't get our rating anymore and you're off and you think that's the right thing to do. How do you make a decision to do that? What is the, is it a gut? I mean, how, how do you, how do you know when you've gone too far? If you want to change, AMBES is famously changing their rating model right now. That's an interesting process to observe. That's hard to do as I'm sure you're watching that too. How do you guys do that? Well, I, I'll answer it. You know, certainly from from demo tech's perspective, um, I, I think we we're, we believe that the regulatory process, and there I'm talking about the departments of insurance. I'm talking about risk based capital. I'm talking about IRIS ratios. I'm talking about the market conduct exams. I'm talking about financial examinations. We believe that the regulatory process at the states is is an excellent baseline. And we think that when companies have an opportunity to get high scores, if you will, and again, scores in air quotes, uh, and pass those examinations. But we think that the insurance industry is scrutinized by so many independent professionals before you ever get to a rating agency. You've got the regulators out there. You've got uh, independent auditors out there. You've got uh, public transparency in terms of IRIS results and RBC results. Um, so from our perspective, we think that companies companies are already doing many of the things that a rating agency might want to ask them to do. Yep. For example, enterprise risk management, own risk and solvency assessments, these are imposed on them. What One of the things that we try to do is to draw – a best com- practice. Best practice. Yeah, we, yeah, okay. we, we try to look at the companies Interesting. and we'll tell the companies that don't just put that actuarial report on a shelf. Use it. It's not just about satisfying a regulation. That actuary is trying to get you information. Same thing with your independent auditor. Don't just say, well, yeah, we got our, un- our unqualified opinion, clean opinion, we're good to go. No. Why don't you read it? Read the footnotes. Read the management letter. Same thing with your your own management discussion and analysis. Don't just write it for the sake of getting it done. Make it meaningful to to the regulator. Incorporate it in your your enterprise risk management. So, I mean, th- this idea. I mean, the other thing we we we, we joke at, at at Demo Tech. We kid around internally. We say, you know, we'll have a company approach us. It's unrated. It's been around since 1862. And we always say, well, we kind of like their chances making it another year. I mean, when you look at some of the companies that are out there that, and, and again, they're smaller. They, they might only be in, you know, 15 counties in a state. But when you look at some of the companies that have been around answering the bell quarter after quarter, year after year for 100 years or more, what is it that anybody can do for them or give them insights on. I think what you really have to do is get them to step away from the day-to-day and and say, don't look at this ORSA or this ERM as a regulatory requirement. Look at it as a way of you to tell your story because you've been answering the bell consistently for well over 100 years. This is your opportunity to really to rise and shine. You should be embracing this, not pushing back against it. So I, I think that it really is a matter of, of finding good companies that are maybe feeling like a regulation is an additional burden on them that they don't need and educating them to the point where they say, oh, wait a minute, you mean I can get this sort of information and insight out of this regulatory uh, requirement? 
So it, it, it's really a little bit of, of, of an opportunity for the companies to be to be a little more forward thinking because I think we all tend to be focused on you know kind of the what's urgent as opposed to what's important and I, I think from my perspective that's one of the things that we like to, to do with the companies let them know that we're there to assist them and, and sometimes you know it's not a deposition this should be a collaborative discussion because we're trying to find out more about you so that we can assist you put your best foot forward because I, I, I mean, I, I again, I look at it from from the perspective. There's no companies out there that have been around 75, 80, 100, 125 years that don't know what they're doing. I don't care what industry you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, so, two more questions. Uh, one, I should have asked at the beginning, where the name Demo Tech comes from. Uh, <laughs> maybe just quickly address that. Where, where did that come from? Okay. Well, all right. Uh, keep in mind that you know, we were incorporated in 1985, and back then Demo Tech was a, kind of a funny name. But but now you've got names like Alphabet, Google, Yahoo, Bing, uh, that maybe aren't as funny. But you got tech in there. That's very modern. <laughs> that was well. We were actually we were the first insurance disruptor. We actually had the audacity to take on what was in effect a functional monopoly. But the 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 demo tech is actually a short name for a longer name. We have a name saved, and it's Demographics Technologies Incorporated. And the idea in 1985 was that eventually demography and technology will drive everything. And so we had Demotech. Amazing. Which was the short name. You know, I think demography is one of the more undervalued or underrated sources of change in the world. It really is. I mean, I remember listening to a talk a few years ago by a demographer, I suppose, who said um, every single year, everybody gets one year older. And we we are still working on actually the profound implications of that for society, for economics, for history, for geography, for everything else. Um, well, so last question: Who do you think is the, is an audience or constituency out there, or a group of potential clients for your for you that that need you the most? Like, what are the ones that that are most interesting to you right now? You're thinking, man, if you guys just understood what we were doing, it would improve your life. That's a great question. I think our target market, if you will, is going to be smaller, independent companies without access to capital that have a high-quality reinsurance program. And if they're property-focused, that's fine. But if they're casualty-focused, that's fine. I mean, I think for us, it's the smaller companies um, that don't have that independent and um, unlimited pocketbook that they could dip into where they're they're out there they're playing on their own dime they've got a business plan they've got strong people we'd love to talk to them great my guest today was joe petrelli joe thanks for joining me thank you david enjoyed it